Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Encouragement for the Journey, a weekly radio program designed to help Christians in their daily walk with Christ. If you would like to join other listeners in the live chat room, go to www.wingsofprophecy.com and click on the live chat tab. Good evening, Blog Talk listeners. Today is Tuesday, August 28, 2012. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and I'm broadcasting live from the Dallas, Texas area tonight, and I'm doing it a little bit differently tonight. I'm not using Skype. I'm using my cell phone, and I'm not sure how this sounds, so somebody give me feedback afterwards, okay? I'm trying to bypass the weird noises I got on my last broadcast on Thursday. Okay, tonight we are going to be talking about how the enemy sets us up to attack us. I've been getting lots of emails about uh, people being attacked by the enemy in various ways and about various types of temptations and everybody's really having a lot of trouble. Um, A lot of people are falling and, and getting caught in Satan's snares. And so I think this is a good thing for us to talk about tonight. And I think it will encourage you that you can stand against him. Um, I'm going through the same trials and tests, guys. Uh, The same thing is happening to all of us. And so everything that I'm hearing from you is just echoing back to me what's going on with me. So um, I want to talk about some of the enemy's favorite ways to set us up and some of the ways that he set me up before and some of the ways I've seen him set other people up. There's a lot of similarities in some areas, and if we can learn to watch for these, I think it will help us a lot. One of the enemy's favorite ways to set us up is to attack us through another person or through a situation like at work that usually it involves at least one other person and to get us all twisted up in our emotions, uh, get us in pride or strife or get us angry or get us frustrated, And then uh, when he gets you real wrapped up in that, he'll give you time to really boil for a while. And then when he gets you real wrapped up in that, then he'll blindside you with temptation. And in that way, he can get a lot of people to fall. And here's the reason. When, When we're all wrapped up in emotion and we're already upset, we're in that place that's kind of like the fiery desert 
And we're always looking for comfort when we're uncomfortable because we're human. And so if he tempts us with some kind of temptation that's any kind of comfort, um, then it's going to look real good at that point, okay? So he waits around for the most opportune time. But it, there's another thing you have to understand about Satan is he sets these things up. He plans them ahead of time. He plans them, and he will use unbelievers or people who are not really, you know, very far in the walk or people that are just immature, and he will attack you through them. He'll have them say something to you or just, you know, flip out on you or whatever. Or maybe you have a family member that's real prideful or real arrogant, and he'll have them get in your face, you know, something like that, and get you all upset about that. And then he'll wait a little while, and he'll keep encouraging you to think about that, and then he'll hit you with temptation. That's what he does, and he does it, he does it uh, quite often, actually. A lot of people are still going through a lot of trials and a lot of times of testing, and we know that we've entered a new level of testing, a new time of testing right now where every test counts and how we react to every test counts. And it's hard to remember that when we're right, you know, that's hitting us in the face. And I forget about it, too. But that is, that is a lot of his goal is to get us worried, to get us aggravated, um, especially if we're, our circumstances are, you know, compromised. Maybe we're not making enough money or we're having to live someplace we don't want to live or we have to live with people we don't really like or we're upset, we're scared, we're angry, we're frustrated, we don't know what happened to our lives. You know, we're broke, busted, and disgusted. It is so easy for him to tempt us when these things are going on, when these conditions are in our lives, everything is already so hard, you know, and our flesh is already being tried in so many other areas that it's really easy for him to just throw a temptation at us. And we have to fight it 10 times harder during those times than during good times. So um, we need to be aware that any time our emotions flare suddenly, in any area, we need to immediately be on alert, and we need to get our emotions under control before our flesh follows it, okay? I'm getting tons of emails that indicate that the enemy is still attacking relationships, and he's attacking them hard, and I'm seeing that in my own life, too. Misunderstandings, miscommunications, and just downright attacking you through other people that are less than pleasant, Okay? Um, you know, relationships that maybe you've tried to make them better and they're just not all that much better. And he just uses, he uses people's mouths against us to get us upset or to get our emotions all wrapped up, you know, so he can distract us with that. He plays on our emotions, our weariness, our tiredness. He magnifies our struggles. And that's a word for somebody, by the way. I've got two words tonight, y'all. I was sitting here preparing notes for this, and, and as I was writing this, there is a man listening that the devil is magnifying your struggle, and he is making you think that you're climbing a mountain, and God said that that's just a molehill, and he said you better get over it because you will face a mountain eventually, and he said I need you to keep your wits about you when you do or you're not going to make it. I don't know who you are, but you'll know when you hear this word. So we need to put everything into perspective. And, you know, I've done the same thing. I've so done that so many times, especially in 2009 when I was in that last wilderness. I would be sitting around, you know, wringing my hands, getting all fearful and getting afraid. And, and I was just making big mountains out of just molehill stuff. And then a few days later, the Lord would show me how small of a situation that actually was in the overall scheme of things, and I would just feel silly. And what it is is it's the enemy getting us to worry and be fearful. If he can make us afraid, he kind of paralyzes us because if we get scared or we get real worried, we're not going to be taking action. Anytime we get too emotional, we're not going to be moving forward. We're not going to be taking action. We're going to be standing still. And that's what he wants. If he can't get you to not believe, he at least wants to get you to not do anything, okay? He wants to delay your progress or stop it. If he can't get you to go backwards, then he'll at least try to stop you from going forwards. 
So, if you know, pay attention. If you get y'all twisted up and worried about something, you know, that later turns out to be really insignificant, you know, it's because he's trying to make you think that he's king of the hill and he can wreck dest destruction in your life. He's like a terrorist. He wants you to fear his power, but he don't have any power. The only real power he has is to deceive us, and that's if we let him. So on tonight's show, I want to talk some about methods that we can use so that he can't deceive us as often and be getting away with this all the time, y'all. And I've got a word for somebody else tonight, too. I was sitting here making these notes, and, and God just started speaking this to me. There is a sister listening tonight to this broadcast and or listening to it in archives, I'm not sure. You are at the end of your rope, and God said to tell you that he sees where you are, and he is about to move mightily in your situation and for you not to give up. He said that you've passed through some very hard trials, and for you to remember that it is pressure that creates diamonds, and he said you're going to be a diamond for him. I don't know who you are. But when I was writing this, I was almost taken over by chills as he was talking to me and telling me this word. Your anointing after this trial is going to be amazing. He said that you've basic, basically lost everything. But he said to tell you this. He said, I shall restore to you the years the locust has eaten. And with increase, he said, you will be amazed. He is saying... As you watch my hand move, you will be amazed when you see what I give you for all you've lost in, for my name's sake. He said, be encouraged. Look up and rejoice, for your God is moving on your behalf in a mighty and an unexpected way. And Father, I just lift my sister up to you right now. Father, I ask that you would give her a fresh anointing of your strength, Lord, that you would just infuse her with extra strength, Lord, and lift her up, Lord. Help her to hold on a little longer, Lord, because we know how hard it is when you're at the end. And I just, I'll just, i just continue to pray for you tonight. I just want you to know I will continue to pray for you every time God brings you up in my spirit. And, Lord, I ask it in the name of Jesus. So there's a lot of temptation going on right now. There's a lot of attacks against relationships still going on. And I'm getting a lot of emails about from people that are struggling with lust, and I get some all the time anyway, but I'm getting more lately over the last two weeks than I've been getting in the past. Um, and this is an area that I've dealt with extensively myself. Y'all probably heard me talk about this. And I came from there are generational curses that were on my line from my father's bloodline and my grandfather's bloodline. Uh, of adultery, fornication, incest. I don't even know what all is there, but I know for sure those were. And I had to break all those off. And being a survivor of sexual abuse, that comes at you at a very early age, and it, it will create a stronghold before you are even old enough to know what hit you. Uh, you can have a stronghold before you're 20 years old. And when that happens, then you've got to fight it twice as hard. You know, I mean, I wasn't even a, a Christian in this walk until I was 36. There was one other time that I was trying to go to church and everything, but nobody talked about deliverance. Nobody talked about generational curses or any of that. I had no idea. So I want to tell you some of the things that worked for me because I think they will help you. That is a very difficult area. Um, it's harder than laying down substance abuse, in my opinion. It's harder than uh, just about anything that I can name, actually. Uh, lust is just, um, because it comes at us, I think, from so many different areas. You know, th the first thing that you have to understand about lust is that when you're dealing with lust, your biggest enemy, your biggest battle is usually you. It's because you're fighting yourself on that one. And you're going to be your own biggest enemy in that fight. It's not really the devil so much as it's just us, okay? You can self-deliver as far as the demons and breaking the curses. You can do that. I did it. Um, you just have to have the knowledge to do it. And I am going to be teaching a series on spiritual warfare and breaking generational curses. I've been studying to start that series, and I've already come under severe attack studying. So the devil's not liking it, but that's too bad. 
um, because we're going to do it anyway. And it will probably be a a fairly um, long-running series because I want to cover it in as much depth as I can. There there is a great need for this, and not a lot of churches talk about it. And hardly any churches have both the knowledge and the manpower to help with these things. Deliverance is very time-consuming and very physically draining, very draining. So you won't see a lot of churches get involved, uh, and most of them don't even know a lot about it, but the ones that do, they just don't have enough people that are willing to put themselves on the line and do that. But that's okay, because you can learn to do it. And you can do it for yourself. You can do it for people around you. You know, you can go however far in that that you want to. There's just some things that you have to understand about it so you don't get into trouble with it. Um, Part of dealing with lust, and this applies to a lot of kind of temptations, y'all. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about this. This applies to all kinds of temptations, but especially to this one. A lot of dealing with lust is diligence and keeping your guard up. against being exposed to whatever you're tempted by. Uh, Everybody's tempted by different things. And, you know, we live in a hypersexual culture. We look at billboards, television, the Internet, magazines. It's everywhere. People are flashing flesh and, you know, sex is everywhere. And it's not only advertised, it's encouraged. Immorality is, is just encouraged in America. I don't know how it is in other countries, but I know it is here. Uh, When you're dealing with lust or trying to get free of lust, you're going to have to be diligent and and start shutting off your exposure to all that, okay, because you can't fight temptation at the same time you're looking at it, and you know what tempts you. Don't play games with yourself and don't lie to yourself. You know what you're tempted by. You have to cut it off. Nobody can do that for you. I'm talking to somebody. Nobody is going to do that for you. If you want to be free, you want to be free. You have to make the hard choices. If, you don't, if you're not willing to make that choice, then you don't really want to be free. Okay? All right. It's going to take a lot of prayer, and you have to be extremely diligent against your thought life. Because with lust, especially with any temptation, but especially with lust or any type of substance abuse, you're going to have to cut that thought off the second it hits your brain. And I mean right then. You've got to shut it down. If you don't, it's already in there, and in two minutes it's going to be too late. Okay? That's very, very important. The battlefield is always the mind with any kind of temptation and any kind of emotional temptation where you are tempted to worry, where you are tempted to get into um, anger, if you're tempted to get into hatred, whatever you're tempted by, you've got to stop it when it hits your brain. When, it, when that thought first comes at you, that's the temptation. That's when you shut it down. The Bible tells us to think on those things that are pure and lovely and of a good report. If what you're tempted by is to go off on your husband and scream at him and call him bad names, then you've got to stop that thought as soon as it hits your mind, okay? Okay. You have to be very consistent in your fight against whatever you're tempted by, but particularly if you are tempted uh, by sexual immorality or any type of sexual sin. You have to fight it the minute it hits you and you get to fight it every time. You can't give in this time and then fight it the next two times and think you're going to win. That's not the way that works. You have to fight it every time. Anytime you want to win over a stronghold, you have to do it this way. You will not win if you don't. You know, if, if I still drink alcohol, um, I can't take a drink one time and resist it the next two and go, oh, okay, I don't drink. No, you still drink. You're drinking every third time. You're still a drinker, okay? Every time you give in to that temptation, it gains strength, and it gains power over you. That sin gets a little stronger. And every time, especially in areas of lust where sexual sin is is involved because so many different kinds of demons come in with that, you're letting more spirits attach to you. That's one of the reasons it's so important that you fight it every single time. Demons come in, they run in packs. They run in particular groups. Every deliverance minister can tell you this. They run every time you find a certain demon, you know to look for, there's five or six others that you know if one, that one's in there, that probably some of those other ones or all of those other ones are going to be there every single time. And the reason is because that first one gets in there and he holds the door open and he lets the others come in one at a time. Okay, sexual sin's the same way. Lust is the same way. Okay. 
if you do fall, whatever your temptation is, whether it's lust or something else, if you fall, get back up. Whatever you do, especially now, do not stay down. Get up. I don't care if you have to get up three times a day. Get back up and cry out for mercy and keep asking God for help. Because when you give up and stay down, Satan's got you. It's very important that you police yourself on this and you get back up. You may not feel that conviction hit you like you felt in the past. So you know when you've committed a sin. Get up. Ask God to forgive you. Lord, I messed up that time, but I really do want to do the right thing. Please help me. Give me the key to this. Show me what I need to do to get free. You know, show me what I'm doing wrong, why I'm falling to temptation. Why did I fall again? Get back up. Keep getting back up. Because the people that don't get back up, I've seen some people that I thought were really strong Christians go back out into sin and stay there. You've got to fight it. If you don't fight it, he's going to own you. I'm not kidding. He's going to own you. Okay, let's talk about Satan's tool bag. I was thinking today, okay, what does he use? What are his weapons against us? We know what our weapons are against him. What's he using on us? One of the main things that Satan uses to make us stumble is he uses accusation. He is the accuser of the brethren. We know that from Revelation 12.10. Okay? Satan accuses God to you. He'll say bad things about God to you to try to get you angry at God. You know, so-and-so died of cancer. Well, God doesn't love you. He wouldn't let them die. He'll say stuff like that. And you have to rebuke him when he starts that garbage, okay? Don't let him slander God in your ear. That's not right. We shouldn't be listening to that mess. He will accuse other people to you. This is how he starts problems in relationships and friendships. He will accuse people to you. He will accuse you to you. That's how he gets you into condemnation, okay? Condemnation and conviction are two different things. When you sin, it's, it's the Lord that makes you feel conviction. It's the Holy Spirit. And conviction makes you want to repent and do better. Condemnation, which comes from Satan, makes you want to give up. It makes you feel like you're just, there's no hope, that you're not going to get any better, okay? Okay, another tool that Satan uses is distraction. Just like somebody that, like a pickpocket, pickpockets will usually run in pairs. One of them will bump into you and distract you while the other one walks past you and takes your wallet. Okay? Satan will use distraction. Somewhere around you, he'll get you distracted looking at your neighbor and how she's doing this or doing that, and while you're looking at her, he sneaks in on you and tempts you with something while you're not paying attention. And you weren't paying attention, so you didn't have your guard up. So what's going to happen then? You're going to be weakened. And if you fall to the temptation, you're going to be further weakened so he can hit you again. See, and you got to think about that. Because when you fall once, you're going to be distracted by the fact that you fell, and you're going to be distracted because you're weakened. Okay? See how he does this? He just keeps hitting you with other stuff. Okay? His biggest tool is deception. He's especially uh, adamant about deceiving you in regard to the truth about sin and hell, the reality of hell. He works hard on people with that. And sometimes he gets them. He'll get people that have been Christians for years and years and convince them that some things are not sin, that are sin, or convince them suddenly that there's no hell. Don't fall for that. Just read the Bible. It'll tell you. Ask the Lord. If you don't know, ask him. He'll show you something that'll, that'll prove to you whatever you need to know. Satan uses the tool of doubt. Um, he uses a lot of doubt to make us, conde- make us feel condemned. When we do wrong, he'll try to make us doubt that we're saved or doubt that we can ever do better. Okay? Um, he uses the tool of making you feel like you're defeated. And he's doing that with a lot of people right now. He's making people feel like there's no hope. He's, got, he's tempted them over and over, and they're feeling like they, they can't ever climb out of the hole that they're in. And that's not true. That's a lie, y'all. Don't fall for that. That's not true. People come back after being backslidden for 10 years. 
you're in no more of a stronghold than they were. You can come out too, and God wants you to come out, and he will help you to come out. You just have to cooperate with him. And when you first start fighting, your fight's probably not going to be very strong, but if you keep fighting, it'll get strong because God will just step in suddenly and he'll help you get free. And then he'll teach you something that you can share with other people and help them. Satan would use the tool of discouragement. He's using that a whole lot right now. He wants to stop you from going forward any way he can. He doesn't care how he does it. Deception, doubt, discouragement, he don't care as long as he can stop you from going forward. And Satan's very big on attacking at the beginning of a thing and at the end of a thing. You'll always attack in between, too. But if you look at the life of Jesus, you will see that he attacked very heavily at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he'd been fasting, and then he attacked at the very end through Judas. But all the times in between, he attacked through people, unbelievers, Pharisees. Remember that? And he tried to get him into emotion and all that, but Jesus didn't fall for that. He just answered him with the truth, and it was done. He didn't fall for it. Satan will try to attack you with procrastination. If he can't stop you, he wants to delay you or distract you so he can hold you back. He wants to hold you back from coming out of a fall if you have fallen and keep you from getting back on the path because he knows God will help you. He knows that. He knows God will help you. That's why he wants you to give up. He knows full well that when God's children cry out to him and ask for mercy and ask for help, that God wants nothing more than to help us. It's, we're praying in line with his will when we do that. It's his will for us to be free. It's his will for us to be delivered. It's his will for us to be able to live holy and righteous before him and not be in sin. He doesn't want us to be a slave to sin. Of course he's going to help us. Even if we've done it a hundred times. Remember the prodigal son? How long did he lay in the pig pen? Come on, y'all. He laid in the pig pen for a long time, but the minute he went home, they put a robe on him, gave him a ring, and threw a big party. God does the same thing for us. Satan can and does tempt us through the ungodliness in the world around us. And we are tempted when we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. That's James 1.14. But we're tempted in a lot of ways through the world. We're tempted with pride, whether it's pridefulness about circumstances or about how right we are about something or pridefulness about not submitting to authority. Pride and rebellion run together, y'all. That's how Satan got kicked out of heaven. Um, Satan will tempt you with worldly wisdom, the kind of wisdom you get through education. You know, he'll make you think that he makes a lot of people believe that Christianity is just, you know, a crutch for weak people. I have to, I hate to tell them that, you know, being a, a, a sold-out Christian is nothing about being weak, y'all. But he will tempt people with worldly wisdom to look at logic and reasoning instead of looking at truth. Um, he will tempt us to worship anything besides God. He distracts us with false gods, idols like wealth and success and education. Anything we trust in that isn't God, he's happy about. He'll attack our bodies with sickness and disease. That's a distraction too. Did you know that? If you, He hit me with that Saturday night. I got so sick Saturday, I thought I was going to have to go to the emergency room, and it just came out of the blue. And I was studying for the spiritual warfare series when he hit me. And I mean, it came out of nowhere, and I don't even know what it was. still don't know what it was, but it's gone. He will attack us through the people around us and do his best to get us into strife, which opens the doorway to all the evil works. That's in James 3.16 if you want to look that up. Part of what we use against Satan is the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6. Satan will always lie to you, and he will try to make his lies sound like truth. He'll mix just enough scripture in there to make it sound like truth so he can get you in error. And that's what the belt of truth is for. He will attack your heart, your emotions, your self-worth, and your trust. The breastplate of righteousness 
protects you from that. These are excerpts from the Life Application Bible, by the way. He will attack you in the form of insults and verbal attacks. Those are just more of his flaming darts. He will try to make you doubt your salvation. That's what the helmet of salvation is for. And the sword of the spirit, the word of God, is our only offensive weapon, and that's what we have to take up against him no matter what he's attacking us with, no matter what he's tempting us with. But your first line of defense is still going to be your thought life. No matter what the temptation is, if you're tempted to be angry at someone, if you're tempted to, um, you know, just flip out on them, if you're tempted by, you know, something sexual, if you're tempted to get high or drink, whatever you're tempted by, it, it starts in your thoughts, and that's where you have to shut it down. The minute it hits, You've got to compare it to the truth in God's word and go, nope, that's not what God says, and shut it down right there. Rebuke it. Don't let it in. When you let it in, it starts roaming around in your head, and when you accept it, you accept the demons that come with it. That's how demons attach to you. The majority of the times, they come in through your thoughts. Generational demons are a little bit different, but regular demons it always starts in the mind. When you entertain the thought, And that means start thinking it and start thinking, oh, yeah, I think I might want to do that. That's when you bought it, okay? When you buy it, that's when once it's in there, it's going to conceive and sin's going to come forth if you don't get it out of there. And once, when you give in to a sin over and over again, no matter what that sin is, the sin might be bitterness. It might be, you know, to, to get bitter against God, to get bitter against the world, against people because your life is terrible and you hate it and everything's bad and, Before you know it, nothing good will come out of your mouth. That's bitterness. Have y'all ever been around a person that was just negative all the time? Nothing good ever came out of their mouth? And they're always just saying real mean and nasty things? That's a person who has a root of bitterness. And what's happened is something somewhere along the way disappointed them really bad. And they thought on that disappointment. The devil tempted them to think on that disappointment and get angry about it. So we hit them with disappointment. They bought the disappointment. We introduced thoughts of anger. They bought the anger. They nursed the anger, and the anger became resentment. And that becomes unforgiveness and bitterness. And then that root of bitterness springs up, and it'll take over. And when it does, there is nothing positive going to come out of your mouth until you rip that root out. So thinking on bitter thoughts, is that's a sinful temptation. And if you buy it and you sit there and think that, you know, the bitter thoughts, if you keep thinking them over and over, then that sets up a stronghold. The longer you've given into the sin, the stronger hold it has on you and has on your thoughts. But you can still get free. Because all that is is the demons are attached to you and they keep introducing that to you over and over. And there may be multiple demons by that time. So what you do is you bind up the demons to shut them up, and then you start casting them out one by one, and you get them off of you. And then you've just got to stand your ground because for about two weeks they're going to torment you and try to tell you you're not delivered, and they're going to try to bring the temptation back and get you to buy it again because they don't want to leave. Their favorite thing is to have a human host. Their least favorite thing is to be sent back out into dry places. They don't want to do that. So... You have to fight it for a little while, but once you fight them and show them they can't come back, they'll leave you alone. So that's how that works. You can get free. If you've been given into sin for a long time, it's going to be more of a fight. That doesn't mean you can't do it. If you've been given into several sins, it's just more than one fight. You can still do it. You pick the first one, and you start on that one. And you just start resisting on the other ones a little bit at a time, and you'll get free. We're going to talk about all that in the Spiritual Warfare series. I'm going to uh, try to cover all the basic stuff uh, on those and get as detailed as I can about um, how to get yourself free, how to get other people free, how to get your house clean of demons, and how not to let them come back, um, the things to say and to do, to cast them out, and why? I'm going to be as thorough as possible when I do that series. It's probably going to be a Thursday night series. It's probably going to be on the the regular Wings program on Thursday night that I do that. 
and it will probably run for a number of weeks because I'm going through right now making notes and going through about 10 or 12 books to get some more notes for it. Uh, these are books that, some of them are books that I've studied and some of them are um, new books I haven't had time to read yet. Because I want to give you as much information as possible on that so that you can get yourself free and get your house clean of demons and know what to do and not do so that they don't come back and you don't um, you know, get in that same predicament again. A lot of times, you know, we live in houses and there's demons there that, you know, we had no idea about. I found out that the rent house that I live in, that there was actually a murder committed here. And I had been um, approached to buy the spirit of death here in 2009 and didn't know that and wondered how it got in the house. I'm like, okay, how did that get in? And that's what it was. It's a, it was attached to the house. And when I found out, then I made it leave, but didn't know. So there can be spirits attached to the property where you live. Um, there can be spirits that are coming in generationally, and there are going to be the other spirits are probably spirits that you let in with sin or with objects in your house or things like that. So we'll go into all that. Those all have to do with temptation. They all have to do with, um, you know, how the enemy gets at you, how he gets into your life, how he gets you into sin, and how he keeps you there. You know, if there's a, a spirit there, it's going to keep tempting you. You know, you may resist it one time, but it's going to keep coming back and tempting you. And that's one of the things about generational curses that makes it so important to understand how they work is um, if you, let's say you have a sin that you've had for years and you just got into the walk and you're trying to get free of it, okay? So you find out that you can cast out the demon. So you cast out the demon, and then two days later, you're doing the sin again. And every time you cast out the demon and it keeps coming back, a lot of times the reason is because there is a generational curse in place that is a legal right for those demons to come back. And that's why you're not getting free. A lot of times that's exactly the problem. The other problem is there's more than one demon in there. So um, that's one of the reasons why generational curse is so important to understand so that you can get all the way free. And something my friend Jay uh, reminded me of when I was emailing with her today that I was going to do the series, and she used to do a whole lot of deliverance. And she said, you know, one of the things that people do is they, uh, they'll do deliverance on somebody without asking God if that person is ready or not to be delivered. And what happens when you do that is you can actually hurt them. I was going to do a deliverance one night for somebody, and the Lord literally spoke to me and said, don't. Don't deliver him. You will hurt him. And he showed me that he was, he was going to continue to sin, and he was not ready to be free. And if I delivered him, all that would happen was they would come back with seven more wicked, according to that one scripture. So you can actually hurt someone just jumping out there and fighting the demons without checking with God first. And it's the same way when we do deliverance on ourselves. You need to be serious about getting free. You need to be serious about laying the sin down. If you don't and you cast out the demons, guess what? They're going to come back with seven more wicked because you swept the house clean. And it's very important when we say, Lord, I'm serious, I want to lay this sin down, that we mean it. And we stick to that because we are setting ourselves up if we don't. And Satan knows that they can come back with seven more. So he's going to try harder to get you to, to do the sin again when he knows that you've done deliverance. And that's why. And that's why sometimes when we try to stop doing something, we try to give up a certain sin that it keeps coming back stronger and stronger, and we're like, what is going on? That's why. That's what's going on. You're doing the deliverance, and you're kicking the demon out, and he's going to get in his buddies and coming back. Then he just gets you to do the sin again. And it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. We have to choose. God's told us that over and over through the prophetic words. You must choose who you're going to serve. If you're going to serve the sin, go ahead and serve it and don't try to deliver yourself in the meantime because you can make it worse. If you're going to serve God, you're going to have to be serious and hate the sin. You've got to be sick of it and ready to give it up. And if you're not, ask God to make you that way because he'll be happy to do that. 
He will be happy to do that. Okay, that's all I got for you all tonight. I hope that this helps somebody. Um, I know it's a terrible struggle when you're trying to get out of sin patterns and they just keep hanging on and on and on. And, you know, a lot of times we're standing there with a big question mark on our face going, Lord, I thought I did everything I needed to do. What's going on? And we just need to examine all these things and understand how the enemy works and understand how to get free of him. And we need to understand the spiritual laws in effect with all of this. So we'll be talking about this some more on the Spiritual Warfare series. And in the meantime, I'm praying for you guys that you'll be able to get free. And uh, everybody, you know, try to hold your own and hang in there. Whatever you do, do not give up and lay down. Just keep getting back up. Just keep getting back up. Because if you give up, then he's got you. And you're not going to go any further. But God bless you. I hope that you have a great week. And see you again Thursday. Thank you so much for joining me for Encouragement for the Journey. You can find more of my talks on my YouTube channel, Texas Author and the Number One. You can contact me by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com or by mail at Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 127, Princeton, Texas, 75. Four zero seven. Join me again next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time for another edition of Encouragement for the Journey. Encouragement for the Journey is not affiliated with any church, denomination, or nonprofit organization. Through the blood and through the fire